Welcome everyone to our Amazon Document DB Focus Day. Uh, before we jump into our content, we'd like to introduce ourselves. My name is Jason Plank, and I'm a go-to-market specialist on the Document DB service team. I've been in the industry for about 20 years and have held various roles such as product management leader, development leader, and obviously my role at AWS now is a go-to-market specialist. Uh, at this point, I'd also like to pass uh, the microphone over to Doug Bonger, who will also introduce himself. Thank you, Jason. Uh, my name is Douglas Monser. I'm a senior document DB specialist solution architect. Um, I've been in the industry like Jason uh, over 20 years, uh, background in IT uh, development and also solution architect type of roles. Been working with document databases for six or seven years now, so very familiar with the space and uh, looking forward to uh, looking forward to talking to everyone here today. Excellent. Next, we'll, we'll uh, go through our focus day overall agenda. We'll start off today with the overall agenda for, for our focus day. Uh, we have a couple of different, different lectures as well as uh, a couple of different labs. Uh, we'll start with an introduction to Amazon Document DB. Uh, once we're done with that, we'll go through a uh, deep dive of Amazon Document DB, at which point we'll then get into a lab. Uh, and this is our introductory lab uh, where you'll get hands-on experience with, with Amazon Document DB. Uh, following that, we'll go back into lecture and we'll cover uh, migrations to Amazon Document DB. And then we'll close off uh, the focus day with a uh, migration lab to D Document DB uh, from MongoDB using uh, DMS. In our first section, I'll cover the introduction to Document DB, which will cover topics such as why Document DB, uh, an overview of the service, uh, some of our, rec our uh, recent releases, as well as uh, touch on our MongoDB compatibility. Uh, we'll close out with pricing and obviously some Q&A. As we get started, uh, it's important for us to, to level set and look across the AWS portfolio. We offer a broad set of databases and, and analytic services for our customers to lift and shift their database analytics workloads to the cloud. Customers are doing, it, are doing this at record levels across many of the multiple areas that you see here. For customers wanting to move away from self-managing Oracle, SQL Server, MySQL, and MariaDB databases, AWS offers Amazon RDS and Amazon Aurora. For customers wanting to move away from self-managed non-relational document and key, key value stores such as MongoDB, Redis, and Memcached, AWS offers DynamoDB, DocumentDB, and ElasticCache. For customers that want to move away from their expensive proprietary Teradata, Oracle, and SQL server data, data warehouses, they're, they're moving to uh, Amazon Redshift. Customers that want to move their Hadoop and Spark deployments on-premise are doing are moving them to EMR for cost savings and the addition of having a managed having a managed service. For customers that want to move from their ElastiCache, Logstash, and Kibana, otherwise known as Elk Stack, on-premises solutions, they're moving to ElastiCache for cost savings and and ultimately as well having a managed service. We have real-time analytics for customers that want to move from their Apache Kafka deployments to Amazon Managed Streaming for Kafka. We'll start now with talking briefly you know, about what is DocumentDB. Uh, in one of our next sessions, Doug, is, Doug Bonser is going to walk through some of the challenges of scaling on-prem databases. Uh, as we as we looked at those challenges, we also worked backwards from what our customers were asking for uh, in terms of a managed service when it comes to managing document documents. Uh, we built Amazon Document DB from the ground up. Just to be clear, we're not a drop-in replacement for MongoDB. We don't use Mongo source code. We are not taking a, you know, a Mongo version and, and wrapping a control plane around it. Uh, what Amazon Document DB is, is a fast, scalable, fully managed MongoDB compatible database service. Fast in that you can pro we can process millions of requests per second with millisecond latency. Scalable, as in we separate 
Uh, we separate compute and storage, which, which allows us to scales both scale both independently. We can scale out to 15 read replicas in minutes. We're fully managed in that it's managed in that this service is managed by AWS. You have no hardware provisioning, no auto patching, you have quick setup, secure and automatic backups. As mentioned, we are a Mongo, we are a MongoDB compatible service and we're compatible with the MongoDB 3.6 and 4.0 versions. We use the same SDK, you can use the same SDKs, tools and applications with Amazon DocumentDB. Overall, this is a purpose-built document database service engineered for for cloud and cloud scalability. Um, as you look across the industries and customers and ultimately market segments, you can see that we, we, we touch on and we have customers in a number of these different segments. Um, we have a lot of customers at this point running mature workloads on DocumentDB. The first, one we'll, first customer we'll talk about is one of our internal customers, which is obviously Amazon, fulfilled by Amazon. Complex documents that require nested indexes, ad hoc queries, and aggregations. Woot replaced a, replaced a self-managed product catalog database running on Mongo 2.2 with Amazon DocumentD, DocumentDB. The Washington Post powers their publishing business and machine learning platform. They leverage the automated backups and multi-AZ failover for resiliency and scalability. And Samsung leverages DocumentDB's ability to have dynamic and changing schemas, and they were previously running on a relational database. Next, we'll get into document databases and talk about why document databases, use cases, and, and, and some example structure. So the first, the first question, or the first question to, to always, you know, that we like to cover is what is JSON? So JSON is a lightweight data interchange format. It's easy for humans to read and write, and it's easy for me, machines to parse and, gener parse and generate. JSON is a text format that is completely language independent, but uses conventions that are fit, conventions that are familiar to programmers of the C, C family languages, as well as Java, JavaScript, Perl, Python, and many others. These properties make JSON an ideal data exchange. JSON ultimately represents uh, data in two ways. One, an object, or, which is a collection of name, value, or key value pairs. And number two, an array, which is an ordered collection of values. To carry, to carry on now why document databases, data is stored in, in a JSON-like format, which is something that, that we just touched on uh, just a second ago. Um, the, this structure, uh, as I mentioned, maps naturally to how we think about modeling data in our applications. We don't typically mo model data in tabular format in our heads. We're thinking about groups of things instead. We also have flexible schema, schema and indexing. And what exactly does that mean? Well, you, you can work with a dynamic schema that can change depending on your data needs and access patterns, and you have no need to, to design co a complicated rigid schema. Indexes can be created and dropped on in on demand and be declared on any value or any field within your documents, including fields nested with arrays. In order to add, add in order to provide ad hoc capabilities, uh, JSON has an extensive query language that's built for documents. You can re retrieve specific fields, values, and even regular expression queries. DocumentDB uses a JSON, JSON kind of query language, so it's very, very easy to learn. If you look across some of our, some of our industry use cases, um, you can see you know, content management, mobile, personalization, catalogs, retail marketing and user profiles. If you look at mobile, it's very easy to store data that you're collecting uh, and going back and back and forth between devices, uh, especially you know, back to that JSON format, uh, which, which a, lot of, a lot of mobile apps are, are already leverage. In the case of cataloging, the whole idea is to, is to be able to record an output of machine learning experiments, inventory descriptions, ph ph pharmaceutical trials, and, and et cetera. We see a broad set of customers that use documents for these use cases. In gaming, you can think of storing user profiles, game management, matchmaking, uh, and really the overall, overall uh, life of your, of, your, of your gamer and your user profile. When it comes to retail and marketing, we're seeing use cases around tracking customers who purchase similar items, 
custom marketing campaigns, um, and also aggregation. So min, max, average. If you want to want to understand uh, the output of, of your retail and or marketing campaigns. To get started, let's take a look at user profiles, for example. Let's say that Susan plays a new game called Exploding Snails. As you can see, you can easily add information to Susan's profile. Notice here that we didn't have to design a complicated schema or create any new tables. We simply added a new set of fields in our document. Similar, similarly, we can add an array for the promotions that Susan has achieved. So in this scenario, you can see that, that Susan achieved the new user promotion, 5%, and also a snail lover. The document model really enables developers to, enable, to evolve their applications quickly over time, again, without building rigid schemas. Next, we'll go into the service overview. As mentioned, Amazon DocumentDB is a fully managed document database service. In that, you have automatic recovery, recovery and failure. Replicas are automatically promoted to primary to give you a, a self-healing -heal service. We also provide automatic patching so that you can stay up to date with the latest patches. Maintenance windows happen every few months and you can choose the 30 minutes, 30 minute, 30 minute window. We also have a broad integration into existing AWS services such as CloudWatch, CloudTrail, CloudFormation, Secrets, Manager, VPC, IAM, as well as uh, CLI. We also have a pay-to-go page page pricing model, which really means per second, in, per second instant filling, no long-term no long commitments, uh, and no, no upfront fees. You have the ability to stop and start uh, as you would like uh, as, you're, as you're using the service. One of our customers, FreshHop, who is a online grocery provider, in, enjoys DocumentDB's backup and scalability to help them manage their workloads. As mentioned, Amazon DocumentD is a MongoDB 4.0 compatible service. Just to cover it again, we are not a drop-in replacement for Mongo. We, are, we did build, build this service from the ground up. With our service, you can use the same drivers and tools that you're, that you're using with Mongo with, uh, with Amazon DocumentDB. In terms of replica sets, read scaling is easy with automatic repli replica, replica set configurations. DocumentDB supports replica, replica, replica emulation, where our clusters appear to your drivers to be a MongoDB replica set, which allows you to use driver configuration to easily scale your reads. When you connect to a replica set, you can specify the read preference for the connection. If you specify a read preference of a secondary preferred, the client routes the read queries to your replicas and write, and write queries to your primary instance. This is, this is a better use of your cluster resources. And we'll get into more to more to more of the architecture and uh, reads and writes uh, as we go th go through the deep dive session, which which Doug will be conducting next. And Keto, one of our customers, does inventory automation for SMBs. They're happy with DocumentDB's quick quick and easy ability to get started. From their point of view, everything just worked. The Amazon DocumentDB service is also scalable. And what exactly do we mean by that? Well, you can scale out in minutes. You can scale up to 15, min 15 read replicas. You can scale your instances up in your cluster so that you can scale from four to 768 gig gigabytes of RAM. We also have, we also, uh, when you look at our storage, which we'll dive, dive deep uh, in our next, next session as well, our storage automatically grows from 10, 10 gig to 64 terabytes. What this, what this really uh, eliminates is the need for complex uh, architectures when it comes to the backend storage system. When it comes to load balancing, DocumentDB allows you through replica set em emulation to scale set scale reads across replicas quite easily. When it comes to security and compliance, what one of the things that we like to note is that it is a VPC only service. What that means is you have you are able to provide strict strict network isolation, and ultimately your cluster is not accessible from the internet. We, we follow an encrypt by default policy, encryption at rest with AWS KMS and customer manage AWS keys, as well as encryption in transit with TLS. When it comes to safe defaults, 
Clusters launch with the most secure defaults and you can optionally choose to modify these defaults if, if you choose so. From a compliance point of view, you can see that we have uh, P PCI DSS, ISO 9001, 27001, 27017, and 20, 27018, uh, as well as SOC 2 and HIPAA, HIPAA eligible. When it comes to automatic backups, we provide automatic, incremental, and continuous backups. Automated backups are stored in S3 for 11.9's durability and has no impact on your cluster performance. You restore your cluster at any time during your retention period of the last 35 days up until the last five minutes. We also archive snapshots and you can keep these snapshots as long as you would like. Um, cluster snapshots are user initiated backups of your cluster stored in S3 and they're kept as mentioned it, until you explicitly delete them. You can create a new cluster from the cluster snapshot whenever you desire. One of our customers, Iron, creates DevOps service serverless application tools to manage Docker containers. They're extremely happy with DocumentDB's backup performance and cost effectiveness. From a free feature release point of view, we're, we're always and, and very proud to say that we work backwards from our customers. Our goal is to make sure that we understand what a customer what a customer wants out of a managed service. And then ultimately we work with our customers to make sure that we meet those requirements and build those services uh, into, into our releases. As you can see, since December, 2019, we have released a number of different product releases. In terms of our most recent releases, uh, in June of 2021, we launched Global Clusters. Uh, we also uh, continually launch a new aggregation ops as well as improved indexing. One of our big releases in, in uh, Q4 of last year was support for Graviton2 as well as a JDBC, JDBC driver for, for BI tools. So far this year, we've launched, launched, launched enhanced geospatial capabilities as well as some new, some new operators, as well as a new document DB free trial. Um, in terms of free trial, your organization gets 750 hours per month of T3 medium instance usage, 30 million IOPS, five gig of storage, and five gig of backup storage for free for 30 days. Once your month free trial, trial expires or your uses, usage ex exceeds the free allowance, you can shut down your cluster to avoid any charges or keep it running at our standard on-demand rates. One major release that I'm gonna cover is support for MongoDB 4.0 compatibility, and this includes transactions. With this release, you're able to perform acid transactions across multiple documents, statements, collections, or databases, and you can think of uh, a bank account transaction at, for, as an example. Transactions simplify application development by, enab by enabling you to perform automatic, consistent, isolated and durable asset operations. Also in this release, we, la we launched the ability to use DMS or data Amazon's data migration services from MongoDB 4.0 to DocumentDB, or you can use it to, to migrate from DocumentDB 3.6 to DocumentDB 4.0 uh, to take advantage of upgrade, upgrades or updates in, in our new release. With respect to performance and indexing, we launched the ability to use Hint as well as the Find and Modify API. We also added improvements to reduce overall index sizes. Updated operators is something that we, that we do constantly launch to give ourselves uh, the ability to cover more use cases uh, for our customers that are ultimately looking uh, to consume uh, DocumentDB as a managed service for document databases. One of our other major releases came in, came in mid-2021, which was our global clusters release. We have two primary use cases for global clusters. One, the first use case is disaster recovery, whereby you can promote, promote your secondary clusters to primary for faster recovery in the event of regional failures. The second use case is data locality. This is helpful in use cases where you wanna bring your data closer to users in different regions, uh, which ultimately allows faster reads uh, for globally globally distributed applications. The next, the next topic that I'll cover in this session is pricing. 
From a pricing point of view, we price in four different dimensions. The first dimension is instances. You're billed per second, but, a, but with a 10 minute minimum, you also have the ability to mix and match different instance sizes, depending if you need more read, read scalability or write scalability. Uh, also from an instance point of view, you can stop the cluster. Uh, as you stop the cluster, it will, it will also stop, stop your billing and then it'll restart automatically after seven days. The second area there that, we'll talk, that we talk about for pricing is IO. When it comes to IO, it's 20 cents per million. And these are, uh, these are essentially writes and reads. You can group, we offer the ability to group IO together. So the system's intelligent enough to group these operations together. For example, you're not writing in four 1K blocks and four different IO operations. We try to make one write IO. It's very important to size your, your instances correctly so that you're reading as much data out of your working set cache and not fetching from storage causing IO operations. The next item I'll cover is storage. Storage is 10 cents a gig per month, and we only bill for one copy of your data. As Doug will cover in the next session, we do uh, write five additional copies so that, so that we offer a durable database service. So if you write 10 gigs, you're not getting, you're not getting billed for 60 gigs, you're getting, you're getting billed for your data set size, which was 10. When it comes to backups, Backups have no impact on cluster performance and consume zero IO or compute resources. 100% of your storage data is backed up for free. So if you have a 10 terabyte data set, you can back up all 10 terabytes for free. For any data that goes beyond your 10 terabyte data set, uh, you will incur an additional backup cost of two cents a gig. Uh, as far as our next topic, next we'll talk briefly about migrations. Um, Doug, in our next, in one of our, as we covered off in the original agenda up front, one of our sessions for that we will dive into is, in fact, migrations, where Doug will dive really deep into that topic. Um, when it comes to Amazon Document DB, we we basically have three methods to migrate your data. Number one uh, is the offline method. It's the simplest method, but you incur the you incur longer downtime. So in this example, you can use Mongo dump or Mongo restore tools to migrate your data. Method number two to migrate data into Amazon Document DB is using the online migration using AWS DMS. This allows you for a near zero downtime migration uh, into Amazon Document DB. The third option is our hybrid method. The hybrid method merges the online and offline methods together. It does get a, a bit more complex. There are moving part, parts, uh, because you will ultimately be using Mongo dump and Mongo restore to migrate data and then using DMS to replicate changes. But this is a method that we've seen several of our customers use and use uh, quite successfully. The last, the last topic that I have for the introduction into Amazon Document DB is a list of different programs uh, and investments that we've, that we've made uh, to ultimately make Document DB consumption easier for our customers. The first is cost analysis. So really what this is, it's a sizing questionnaire using your workload metrics to generate uh, a uh, cluster sizing estimate. The next is a compatibility assessment. The compatibility assessment is a self-service tool that you can use on your own. In terms of education and architecture and, and, my, and migration planning, we offer a, a number of different, uh, different programs. Um, no, one is an immersion day. An immersion day ultimately provides the customer with modular content and hands-on labs to learn about document DB use cases, architecture, architecture, best practices, migrations, security, monitoring, and more. These agendas can be customized depending on where you know where you are in terms of learning level uh, with Amazon Document DB. Another 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 program that we offer is a well architect well architected lens. Well -architects, the well-architected lens for Document DB assesses your workloads with a focus on optimi optimizing performance, reliability, security, cost, and operational excellence. The output is that you get a well-architected review report with recommendations to ultimately optimize your workload. The next program that I'll talk about is Springboard. Springboard is a customized migration game plan that essentially allows 
uh, AWS to work with decision makers uh, to ultimately act as a sponsor and diverse stakeholders in your organization. We're essentially going to, going to work with you to take an assessment of your current state from an operations and biz business commitment point of view, as well as make spe specific architectural recommendations on AWS. Ultimately, the output leads to uh, some proposed milestones uh, as well as follow-up action so that we can, we can work with the key stakeholders uh, in, your, in your organization uh, to, to help with planning uh, and executing against your migration. The next program that we offer is our uh, DocumentDB Data Labs. In this example, we, we ultimately provide technical resources and we'll work with customers to build tangible deliverables that accelerate data, data, data modernization initiatives. Customers who built DocumentDB POCs are given pres prescriptive architectural guidance, best practices, and technical roadblock removal by AWS Data Lab engineers and DocumentDB experts. Uh, the outcome to you is a well-architected well document DB prototype with a path to production. We've seen this be really successful to help to help jumpstart migrations uh, and ensure uh, successful migrations as you build a prototype uh, with with the Data Labs team. The last option is our the last program that we have is we we also have a dedicated professional services team. This professional service teams aligns with your business to ensure that you're that you're meeting your outcomes, your business outcomes and objectives, uh, and helps to remove any challenges uh, that come along the way. Ultimately, the professional service TV team can work with you in a number of different scenarios to drive a number of different outcomes, whether it's optimization, migration, uh, or just general consumption. That concludes our set first session, which is which was the introduction to Amazon Document DB. Next up, Doug will, Doug will dive deep into our Amazon Document DB service. And then uh, following that, we will jump into a lab. Doug, take it away. All right, thank you, Jason, for that uh, introduction to Document DB. And uh, as you said, all right, we'll be uh, diving deep into the service now. Uh, and in this session, I'm gonna cover some of the challenges scaling traditional database deployments and then really dive deep into the architecture of Amazon Document DB and show you how we address those challenges. So what are some of the challenges in scaling traditional databases? Right, when we talk about traditional databases, right, it's, it's uh, relational databases you're very familiar with and even some NoSQL databases in that they use an architecture that's monolithic. So to illustrate that, on the left side of this slide, uh, you see a client application at the top connecting to uh, a database server. And that database server is actually a, a monolithic architecture here with different layers uh, of the database all on the same physical server. So you see here the API layer that handles requests from the client application. Uh, then you see a, a query processor, which converts those API calls from the application into queries that the database can understand and execute. Then you see a caching layer that typically is gonna be caching the data stored in the database for faster response times for the application. Uh, the logging layer uh, that's keeping a, a history of the actions executed on the data. And then lastly, at the bottom there, you see the storage layer, which is going to write the data to and read the data from the attached storage. So uh, this is not a cloud native architecture. So some of the challenges when moving these kinds of databases to the cloud, uh, you know, you typically see multiple monolithic servers network together which in turn leads to a number of challenges that I'll talk about now. So the first challenge with this type of architecture is adding read capacity to the database on demand. So let's talk about these challenges in the context of a product catalog use case, right? In that use case, the data is relatively static and doesn't change very frequently. If you are adding products, uh, certainly you'll add more data to the database, right? But as your business grows, uh, ideally, right, you want to see more and more clients accessing your systems and your data. So you need to read uh, more clients are going to need to read that product catalog. So you're going to need to add more read capacity. 
in a monolithic architecture, the only way to get that additional read capacity is to, to add a new node. Like you see here, we've added a, a node four to this uh, initial three node cluster. Now, because of the architecture, again, a monolithic architecture, each node has a local copy of the data. So in this case, the new node you added for additional read capacity is going to need a copy of that data too. So the way we do that is data is replicated from one of the existing nodes to that new node. Uh, and that's going to take some time. Certainly, the more data you have, the longer it takes. And that's also going to affect the performance of the source node. All right, resources on that node that could be handling reads and writes from the application are now going to be used to replicate data to that new node. The second challenge is recovering quickly from a node failure. Uh, so here you see in this scenario, node three has failed in our three uh, node deployment. So to recover, you're going to need to add a new node to replace the failed node. But then you run into the same issues that we saw with adding read capacity. All right, so the replacement node is going to need a copy of that data. How do you get that? Well, the data needs to be replicated from one of the existing nodes to the new node. It's going to take time, which is dependent on how much data there is. And that's going to further reduce the performance of an already impacted database cluster because resources on node two are now needed to replicate the data to the new node. The third challenge is around scaling storage as your data grows. So remember, in the context of a catalog or product catalog use case, right? over time, you're adding new products. Uh, if you consider a uh, what we call a bare metal deployment, right? this may be a self-managed uh, scenario where you're managing the data uh, a database on a single server. Right? And in that case, you're going to have some hard drives attached directly to that database node to store the data. So if your product catalog grows in size, you need scale storage. So that could mean either physically removing existing hard drives from that physical server and installing new larger drives, uh, or in the case of monolithic databases running in your Amazon virtual private cloud, uh, you're going to need to resize your elastic block store or EBS volumes, which again is, is non-trivial. But either way, all right, you're going to reach a point where there's either not going to be disks big enough uh, or you can no longer scale your EBS volumes to store the entire data set. And the fourth challenge is around backup. Right? So how do you backup data without affecting performance? So in uh, traditional monolithic architectures, common approach is to use one of the operational nodes or the nodes handling the, uh, the operational read and write traffic, right? using one of those nodes to create a snapshot of the data. Well, that's going to affect the performance of that node. Right? Resources that could be handling requests from the client application are now being used to, to back up data. So to address that, a lot of times what we see is uh, add an extra node, a backup only node to handle the backups. All right, so with this approach, yes, there's no impact to that operational node, but you do incur additional cost because now you've got an extra node to pay for. And sometimes you'll incur additional cost for a license for that node as well. And then the final challenge, the fifth challenge I want to discuss today is around data durability. So when I talk about data durability that's really concerned with data redundancy, right? having multiple copies of the data so that data is never lost or compromised. Uh, in traditional architectures, an easy way to achieve that is by simply having additional copies of the data, meaning additional nodes. Uh, since the data is local to the node, right, there's really no way to increase the durability of the data without adding more compute resources. So as you see here in this diagram, you, know, you can't have three copies of the data without having three separate nodes with these kinds of architectures. Okay, so now that you understand you know, five of the common challenges we see scaling traditional databases, uh, for the rest of the session, I'm going to dive deep into the Amazon Document DB architecture and show you how we address those challenges. Okay, so you know, here's that stack right, that you saw earlier with the API, the query processor, the caching, the logging, and the storage. Uh, now, when we set out to architect a cloud native database service, uh, the first thing we did is we decided to decouple the compute and storage layers. All right, so the compute layer has the APIs, 
API handling, the query process, or the caching storage layer has logging and storage itself. And now because of the separation of compute and storage, that allows you to scale compute and storage independently of each other and provides a lot of really interesting and unique benefits that help to address these challenges that we just talked about. So just to, to level set, let's take a closer look at this cloud native architecture, right? We just saw a very high level separation of compute and storage, but uh, digging into a little deeper here, you see the compute layer at the top, the storage layer at the bottom. Uh, and in document DB, the compute layer, all right, your compute layer is up to 16 instances distributed across three availability zones in an AWS region. Uh, we support instance sizes, uh, small instance sizes with two vCPUs and four gig of RAM, all the way up to 96 vCPU and 768 gig of RAM. All right, so you've got a lot of options uh, for the instances in your compute, compute layer. Uh, Important to understand there is always a single primary instance in an Amazon Document DB cluster, and that primary instance is what handles all of the writes. Uh, you can also use it for uh, immediate read consistency requirements. Right? If you've got to uh, uh, have immediate consistency, uh, read your own write type of consistency, you can do that with the primary instance. But typically, primary instances are, are used for writing data. And then the best practice is to scale out replica instances or those read replicas to handle additional read traffic. Again, up to a total of 16 instances in a document DB cluster. And that the storage layer, right? The storage layer is a distributed storage volume, right? So it's not just a single large uh, hard drive or anything out there. It is a distributed storage volume. Uh, it can automatically scale from 10 gigabytes all the way up to 64 terabytes in size. And it provides highly durable storage with six copies of the data across three availability zones. So as you see in the diagram, we've got you know, a couple of different colored boxes down there, but you'll see there's like six yellowish boxes and six sort of greenish boxes, right? To, to help convey the point of that six copies of the data across the three availability zones. Now, uh, key thing to understand, and I'll talk about it a little bit more, is no matter how many instances you have in the compute layer, whether you've got the maximum of 16 instances or one or potentially even no compute instances, all right, that data is always replicated six ways across those three availability zones for that highly durable storage of your data. Okay, so. Now let's dig into those five, same five challenges, right? and I'll talk about how Document DB handles and addresses those challenges for you. So again, in the context of that product catalog use case, right, so if you're running your product catalog on Amazon Document DB, right, you may just start with a single instance right, so that you can scale up as needed. Right? Maybe you're just starting out. So here you see a single instance uh, Document DB cluster. Now, as your business grows, right, you can easily scale the compute layer by adding, in this case, a read replica. And now because of that separation of compute and storage, right, there's no need to replicate the data set to that new read replica. If you remember uh, in the previous set of slides, right, you add a new uh, read replica, you've got to copy all the data so that read replica has it. Because the data is all in the distributed storage volume, it's simply a matter of standing up a new instance. And you can add up to 15 read replicas in a matter of minutes, right? It's typically eight to 10 minutes. Uh, it's a conservative time estimate, and it's frequently lower than that, all right? But we tell, we tell customers to figure on eight to 10 minutes to, to add those read replicas. And again, this is regardless of the amount of data that you've got in the database because you're only creating new compute instances. No data is being replicated. No data has to be moved. So in addition to adding read capacity that we just saw or scaling out on demand, you can also scale up on demand. Uh, so in some cases we see customers scale up one of their instances to run maybe complex analytical workloads. Right? In this case, you can see one of the uh, replica instances it has been scaled up to uh, a little bit larger size, right? From an R6G large to an R6G 2X large. All right. Now, again, because of the separation of compute and storage, there's no need to replicate the data to the new larger read replica. And then when you no longer need that for those analytical workloads, they can be scaled back down. 
Uh, we also see customers scaling their entire cluster up during peak hours and then scaling it back down. Again, the architecture allows you to accomplish this without worrying about how long it's going to take because of that separation, no movement of data. So now you can scale up and down in a matter of minutes, regardless of the amount of data stored in the database. And then finally, with the separation of compute and storage, if you take it to its extreme, right, you can actually shut down or remove all of the compute instances in your cluster. All right? And this is typically going to be done in like dev and test environments where you don't need those instances up and running while nobody's working. All right? So you can actually remove all of those compute instances, but you still have highly durable storage of six copies of the data across the three availability zones because the storage is separated from the compute. Uh, the second challenge, if you remember, was quickly recovering from node failure. All right, so with document DB, you can quickly recover from node failure. And he, in this example, you see that the primary instance has failed. So what document DB will do is if you have additional instances, right? This is why we recommend at least two instances in any production cluster. Right? So if you have an additional instance in the cluster, failover is typically going to be you know, about 30 seconds, again, regardless of the amount of data. So within 30 seconds, we detect one of the, the, the instances. In this case, the primary is unavailable. We promote uh, a replica to become the new primary uh, all within 30 seconds. And then after the failover, the service is going to manage uh, standing up a new replica instance to bring the cluster back to full strength. But again, you know, all of that uh, is going to take about 30 seconds to fail over and have a cluster where you can continue to write and read. And then within 8 to 10 minutes, you'll have a cluster that's back at full strength. Challenge three was around scaling, all right? Scaling storage as your data set grows. So if you remember talking about our product catalog use case, right? Over time, you, you add more products, more product lines, you've got more data to store. Uh, but document DB allows you to easily scale storage as your data grows. Uh, and actually, storage scaling is automatic in, in document DB. That distributed storage volume can automatically scale from a minimum of 10 gigabytes to a maximum of 64 terabytes with no user interaction. All right, so effectively, as you add more data to the database, that distributed storage volume is going to grow automatically for you to accommodate that data with no interaction on your part. That fourth challenge was around backing up data with a without affecting performance. Right, so document DB allows you to do that, allows you to back up your data without affecting performance. Uh, and because as you can see in this diagram, there's no compute layer, right? I took the compute layer out. Uh, main reason is compute instances do not participate in backups, right? You don't have to uh, you know, have a, a dedicated instance for backups or worrying up about backups consuming resources on your compute instances because backups are handled entirely by the storage layer. And the backups that we provide in document DB, you see two different kinds here, continuous backups and snapshots. All right, continuous backups, uh, as the name implies, just continuously throughout the day. All right, the, the service is backing up data to Amazon Simple Storage Service, or S3. And those can be used for point-in-time recovery all right, to, uh, with a, a RPO of up to five minutes prior to, to the current time. All right, so if you need to restore to anything past five minutes before right now, all right, you could leverage those point-in-time uh, recovery with those continuous backups. Snapshots, this is a full backup of the data. Uh, that you can have automated snapshots as well as manual snapshots uh, that you initiate. So talked about the storage layer, streaming those changes to Amazon S3 and the incremental backups for point in time recovery, full backups for faster restore times. Uh, so the default of the service is, is one day worth of backups, right? You actually cannot turn off backups in document DB. Uh, so that's why when Jason was talking about the pricing with 100% of your data is free, right? To really strongly encourage backups of at least one day's worth of data uh, or 100% of your data set, right? That's all done automatically for you, actually can't be disabled. Uh, if you do need more uh, data, you know, to, to have a, 
uh, our uh, RPOs past one day, you can go out to 35 days with the um, automated uh, snapshots and backups and manual backups. Of course, you can keep those for as long as you need if you need to extend past 35 days. But again, the main point here is all of this is handled by the storage layer, zero impact to the compute layer, therefore zero impact to your operational workloads from the applications. Okay, and then the last challenge, I'm spending the, the bulk of the time here because it's, it's really key to understand how we do this here, is around data durability. So again, data is highly durable with just one, uh, or as you saw, even no instances in the compute layer, right? But, but here we have one instance. And with a single instance, uh, talk a little bit about availability. With a single instance, you're gonna have two nines of availability, uh, mainly because it's gonna take about eight to 10 minutes to recover from an instance failure, right? You don't have any other replicas that could be promoted to a primary. So single instance clusters are typically used for uh, dev and test environments. Right, but again, data is highly durable. Six copies of the data across those three availability zones. Uh, with two compute instances, you're going to have three nines of availability. Right, because in this case, uh, in the instance of a primary fail failure, failover is typically going to complete in, in 30 seconds, as we saw a little earlier. And two instance clusters are typically going to be used in production environments that maybe don't have very high read requirements, right? Maybe it's a, a relatively low uh, read rate uh, application. So sometimes we see two instance clusters being used for those. Uh, three instance clusters is gonna give you four nines of availability. And this is the default. <clears throat> if you create a document uh, DB cluster, uh, through the console, you'll see that three instances uh, is the default, and it is recommended for production deployments. And again, in the case of a primary instance failure, failover is typically going to complete in 30 seconds. As I mentioned, you can scale out. So with four or more compute instances, you know, do be aware you're still only going to have four nines of availability, right? because the compute instances are still deployed across uh, three availability zones in the region. So additional uh, replicas are not going to increase your availability, right? but you will use that for read scaling right, as we previously talked about. All right, so how how do we actually replicate the data to achieve this durability, All right? So we saw just some high level, you know, different cluster configurations with one, two, three, and four uh, compute instances. Uh, but let's dive a little bit deeper into how we actually achieve this high durability. And so uh, comparing it to, to MongoDB, right? It's Amazon Document DB with MongoDB compatibility, right? So in Document DB, all updates are equivalent to MongoDB updates that have a, a write concern of four and journal equals true. So what does that mean? All right, so basically all that means is that every update in document DB is going to require that four copies of the data are persisted to the distributed storage volume before that update is considered successful. All right. And then all of the replication, as we'll see here in the subsequent slides, is handled by that storage layer. All right. So just walk through an example. Application inserts a new document into the database, right? connects to the primary instance using the MongoDB uh, SDK. All right. It calls the insert API to insert a JSON document that's sent to the primary instance. All right. The primary instance is then going to um, send that to the storage layer, to the distributed storage volume, and that update, that change is going to be replicated across those three availability zones uh, in an animation here. But initially, all right, the first copy in this example is written to availability zone one. Here we see the second copy is written to availability zone two. Uh, the third copy is written to availability zone three, and in this case, fourth copy is written to availability zone two. Now, at this point, all right, we've achieved that right quorum of four, right? I mentioned that right quorum of four, four copies of the, of the change being written. So after those four copies of the change have been written to the distributed storage volume, the primary instance will send an acknowledgement back to the client that the update is successful. 
And then at that time, after the uh, success uh, acknowledgement is sent back to the application, the primary instant is, instance is going to replicate uh, that change data to the replica instances in the cluster so that they can update their cache uh, with the updated data. Uh, I do want to point out, right, the service is smart enough that if the replica instance is not currently caching that data, or are not going to pollute the cache with those changes. Right? So it's only ultimately going to be replicated to any instances that were already caching that data. So at the same time, as the changes are being replicated from the primary instance to the replica instances for caching purposes, the storage layer is going to continue to replicate the data to maintain those six copies of the data across the three availability zones. As you see here, right, we've got two copies in each availability zone. And again, because all of this uh, replication of the data uh, on storage is handled by the storage layer, those replica instances are, are freed up to handle client requests uh, there's no real, um, not much consumption of resources on those instances other than updating their caches. Now, because of this uh, highly durable storage across the three availability zones, we say that document DB is availability zone plus one resilient. Uh, so what does that mean? Uh, so let's walk through a scenario here. Now, uh, a little bit deeper you know, under the covers of the distributed storage volume, uh, data is stored in 10 gigabyte segments. Right? So uh, it's really the entire segment which is replicated six ways across these availability zones. Right? So each segment may actually contain you know, multiple documents. Right? So they're not individual documents, but these 10 gigabyte segments. Now, so if one availability zone happens to go down, all right, document DB can still achieve that right quorum of four, right? Four copies of the data. All right, so because we have two availability zones, we can still update those four copies of the data required for that primary instance to send the acknowledgement back that the right operation was successful. Read operations, uh, they only require a quorum of three meaning they only have to be able to, to read from three of those copies. So in this case, read operations will not be impacted either by the loss of an availability zone. All right, so sum it up with the way our architecture is, even if you lose an availability zone, your data is still able to be read and written in Amazon Document DB. Now, if at the same time, another copy or segment of the data in another availability zone is lost, right, that being the plus one, right, now at this point, document DB can no longer achieve the right quorum. So you won't be able to, um, it will not be able to handle updates at that time, but it is still available for reads because we can still achieve the read quorum of three because we do have three segments that are currently available to read from. And then the recovery from this uh, scenario is really the, the amount of time it takes to copy a 10 gigabyte segment over the network to rehydrate another copy of that storage. And that mean time to recovery is obviously going to be magnitudes, orders of magnitude faster than traditional monolithic database architectures where you need to move the entire data set to recover from a failure. Okay, so in summary, right, you've seen five of the common challenges scaling traditional database deployments and how Document DB addresses these challenges. And really, it goes back to the architecture, right? The cloud native architecture with the separation of compute and storage layers, right? And just to you know to to drive home and sum up those five things there, right? That separation allows you to one quickly add read capacity on demand, right? Within eight to 10 minutes, so you can have additional read replicas, no data movement required. Uh, you can quickly recover from node failure, right? If you have more than one instance, all right, that recovery is gonna be on the order of about 30 seconds, all right? And then another eight to 10 minutes to get your cluster back up to, to full capacity. Right. The, it allows you to automatically scale storage as the data grows with no interaction on your part. It's going to allow you to continuously back up data without affecting performance. And it's going to allow you to achieve that high data durability no matter how many compute instances uh, you have in the cluster. 
so, uh, you know, in terms of what's next, uh, some things that uh, you can look into or refer back to after this session, the first link here, a resources link that has uh, links to our developer guide, to different white papers, blogs, videos, and a lot of other information about Document DB. And the second link here is the workshop, which actually you will be doing two of these workshop modules, one uh, immediately following this presentation session here. Uh, but there are other modules, and they're self-paced, hands-on labs that cover things uh, like an introduction to the service, right? How do you create a cluster? How do you migrate data? How do you monitor it? Uh, security, things like global clusters. Jason mentioned that global clusters feature that we introduced last year, and archiving data with a, a feature that we call change streams. So with that, I uh, thank you for your attention on this presentation. And at this point, we'll move into the first hands-on lab, which is the introduction to Document DB Lab. All right. So thanks for uh, your attention so far. And now we're going to go ahead and get uh, hands-on with Document DB. All right, you've got an introduction to it. And you should, if you don't already have it, you will very shortly have a couple of links in your chat. Uh, one is a link to the lab guide, which is what I'm sharing on the screen right now. Uh, another is uh, going to be uh, what we call a hash that you're going to use to access the event. Uh, and then there'll be a second link uh, if you somehow happen to close your browser or close this tab uh, so that you can access um, the event console directly. But what I'm going to do, how we're going to do this is uh, I'm going to kind of walk through the through the lab with you, right? So you can you can see it, you can follow along. Uh, there will be a couple of points where we're waiting for things to complete, where we can take some questions. I've also got uh, some assistants uh, in the uh, chat who can help answer questions or help you if you're running into any issues as we go through this. Okay, um, so with this link that ends in the slash uh, using dash ee, all right, let's go to that link first because this is a we're going to use this as our starting point again. This is the lab guide. All right, so when you have that page pulled up in a browser, uh, you'll see right here there's a link that we're going to go into what we call event engine. And this is what we're using to, to manage the event. It's gonna give you uh, access to an AWS account that you can use at no charge that you can use for these, these hands-on labs here. Uh, this environment is gonna be available for probably about another eight or so hours. All right, so if you're not able to get through all the hands-on during this time, right, you, can, you can continue to work on it throughout the day. Uh, you could try some of the other labs uh, that are available as well. But when you get to this page, you're going to use the event hash, which again, if you don't already have it in the chat, should be coming through uh, very soon. But you'll go ahead uh, and paste that hash into this terms and conditions screen. And you'll notice that the accept terms and login button has become enabled. So go ahead and click that. And you're going to be asked, how do you want to sign in? Uh, strongly encourage using the, the one-time password, the first option there. Um, you can log in with your Amazon account if you, if you want to. Uh, but in general, one-time password is uh, the easiest option. Uh, we don't use your email for, for any other purposes other than sending you this token uh, to gain access to your environment. So go ahead, click the one-time email passcode option provide an email address and click send passcode. And that's going to take, it usually takes about one or two minutes. And you'll get an email that will look something like this. And this is an example of what that email will look like. You know, check your junk email or your spam folders. You know, look for uh, an email with a subject external, your one-time passcode and the numbers in there. Okay, so just um, give a few moments for, for folks to get that. And while we're waiting for that, I did see one question come across. 
uh, about um, support for Mongo 5.0. Right, so, you know, as Jason mentioned, you know, document DB versions are 3.6 and 4.0, but that doesn't mean you're limited to um, you know, the 4.0 uh, SDKs. So we do have customers migrating uh, that you know, have migrated from you know, 5.0 to document DB. Uh, it's really a question about the, the different operators and aggregators and things that are aggregations, sorry, that you're using. Uh, as long as they're supported in document DB, you'll be able to migrate that workload with, without any issues all right now having said that you know there there will be differences and we, we do document those uh, in the amazon document db developer guide but it, really the best way to the best place to start uh, jason mentioned it in, in his session uh, that compatibility assessment we've got some open source tools that you can use uh, that'll let you know if your workload is going to be compatible with document db 4.0 or not you know even if you're currently on say mongo 5.0 Okay, so let's see here. Okay, I've got my passcode. So hopefully um, some of you have started to receive your passcode. If not, you should be receiving it uh, very soon. Once you get that nine digit passcode, go ahead and enter it here and click on sign in. And that's going to take you to the team dashboard screen. Right now, in this in this event, it's just you know each individual is a team, so everyone is going to have their own dashboard. And what we're really concerned with here is just the the button here on the the first one on the top that says AWS Console. All right, so you don't need to worry about SSH keys or any of these other things. We're just going to use this as the launch point, if you will, to get to uh, get to the AWS console. So I'm going to go ahead and, and click on AWS console. And that's going to just present me with another pop-up with some, some um, information I could use if I'm accessing via CLI, which we're not using the AWS command line interface for this. So we're just going to open the AWS console on the AWS console login page. So click on open AWS console, and that's going to open up a new tab where you can now see, see the AWS console. All right. So just pause there for just a few seconds, uh, give folks a, a chance to catch up. But again, once you enter the one-time passcode token, you're going to see a screen like this that says Team Dashboard. Click on AWS Console. You're going to get a little pop-up where you're going to click Open AWS Console. And you should see, you should see this in your browsers, right? All right. So, that's, I just walked you through the steps here uh, in the lab guide. But do you, you know, as you scroll down, just uh, want to call out, there is a link here to click to configure uh, AWS Cloud9 environment. So do scroll to the bottom of the page. Don't click next right away. Go ahead, click this link to configure the Cloud9 workstation. Now, Cloud9 is a cloud-based integrated development environment, or IDE. So that's what we're going to be using here for uh, the hands-on lab. And we need to just uh, get some access to that IDE and perform a little bit of setup. And the way we're going to access that is through uh, looking at the outputs of a, of a cloud formation stack that was used to create the environment. My cloud formation is uh, infrastructure as code uh, that AWS provides. So the environment's already set up for you. So go ahead and click the link here for Open Cloud Formation Console. And when you click that, you're going to see that a, a number of cloud formation stacks were deployed. But we're looking for the one that in the description, right, here's the description column. And the description says Amazon Document DB Labs stack set. 
Okay, so click on the corresponding stack name. And that's going to take you to the details of this stack. And then in here, we want to go to the outputs tab. Okay, so real quick, I'll look for the description Amazon Document DB Lab stack set. Click on the stack name, go to the outputs tab. And one of the outputs is this Cloud9 URL. So this is the URL for the Cloud9 IDE. Just go ahead and click that. And it's going to take you to the Cloud9 IDE where we just have to perform a, a little bit of setup before we start actually uh, getting into the meat of the lab. Okay, so this is going to take a few seconds to, to get fully initialized. You can kind of see some of the icons popping in here on the left. Uh, you'll see this thing about third-party content. Um, uh, you can click yes or, or no. It doesn't uh, matter for what we are going to do. You can feel free to close the, uh, the welcome tab here or leave it open. But all right, once the Cloud9 IDE opens, go to the window menu and select new terminal. And this is where we're going to be doing the, the interaction uh, with Cloud9 uh, IDE. It's all going to be through the terminal. Okay, So if you go back to the lab guide, uh, you'll see the, the text uh, about what I just walked through there uh, for you. But there's a couple of commands that, we'll, that you'll execute. So do I would strongly encourage just clicking the little uh, copy uh, widget here on the top right of the code snippet. So we're going to copy the commands, paste them into the terminal window that you just created. And that's got all the new lines embedded, and it's going to go off and, and take care of some initialization. So it's, it's downloading uh, the Mongo shell. It's downloading the, the Bodo 3 libraries that we're, that we're using to interact uh, and configuring some environment environment variables and things like that to get you to a to a point uh, where you have everything you need. Okay, and you'll know it's finished. Uh, I'll leave this here for a few moments so folks can see. But uh, you see the last command that was executed was source tilde slash dot bash RC. Okay, and do uh, use the connect uh, chat uh, if you have any questions or if you're running into any issues with the hands-on. All right, if you need help uh, getting, uh, getting past or part of the lab or have any questions about the instruction, do use the connect chat to ask those questions or if you have any general document DB questions. Okay. So at this point, the Cloud9 IDE is configured and has everything that we need for the two hands-on labs that, that we'll be doing as part of the focus day. So we'll go back to the hands-on guide so we're at the end of the of the prerequisites section here. So we'll just go ahead and click next and get into the the first lab, which is the introduction to Amazon Document DB Lab. So at a high level, what you're going to do uh, in this lab is you're going to deploy your own cluster. Right? So you'll get exposure to the uh, the AWS console and how to create and deploy a cluster in Document DB. Uh, you're going to go back to the Cloud9 IDE, interact with it via the Mongo shell, uh, using Mongo APIs to interact with the data. Uh, going to look at a, a simple Python application that interacts with Document DB, so you can see how you can connect to a cluster and and operate with the data from code. And and then lastly, you're going to scale out a cluster. So that cluster that you're going to create, you're just going to create a one node cluster, which again is you know, typically for dev and test environments. And then you're going to use the console to scale it out to uh, a three node cluster. And so you're going to get your, your hands on, uh, hands dirty with the uh, creating and, and uh, operations uh, for of document DB clusters and interacting with the data. Okay, so this is a just a 
brief, uh, not a brief, <laughs> uh, a pretty simplified ver uh, architecture diagram of what, what you're building out here. All right, so you've got an Amazon Document DB cluster, as Jason mentioned, it's VPC only. Right, so it's deployed uh, in your AWS virtual private cloud, uh, right? Best practices to configure subnet groups to you know, limit access to the Document DB cluster only from um, applications that uh, that you want to have access to that. In this case, uh, the AWS Cloud9 IDE is what uh, the environment has already been pre-configured with to allow access. Uh, so that AWS Cloud9 IDE uh, can access the Amazon Document DB cluster. And then on the far left there, your browser is effectively the client connecting to the AWS Cloud9. All right, so you see there's no direct access to Amazon Document DB directly from your browser. All right, it's it's going through in this case Cloud9 IDE uh, to get access to the Document DB cluster. Right, so that's that's a, a look at the the architecture of of this as we as we go through the labs. So now what you're going to do is you're going to create uh, that one node cluster that I mentioned. So go ahead and click the click the link here at the top where it says navigate to the Amazon Document DB console. And once you get here, just go ahead and click launch Amazon Document DB. All right, so this is the first time you're you're accessing the service. So you just click this button. It'll take you right to to the screen that uh, you'll use to provide all the information uh, to create a cluster. And the lab guide has all of the, the details and the information that you'll need to, to enter. So strongly encourage you to use the values that the lab guide provides, you know, unless it says, uh, you know, use a value of your choice. But the cluster identifier or the name is demo document DB. We're using document DB engine version 4.0. That is the most current. And the instance class we're going to change. All right, so we do support the, uh, the, the Graviton, all right, these R6G instances, uh, previous generation R5 instances, and then this T3 medium, which is free tier, free trial eligible. Sorry, uh, Jason mentioned that earlier as well. So we're going to use these T3 medium instance types uh, for this. And you see the, the default is three instances. All right. But in this case, because we want to practice scaling it out and because it takes longer, you know, a little bit longer, maybe a minute or two longer, just in the interest of time, you know, we're just going to go with one instance and then scale it out. So one instance. Definitely use the master username and master password provided in the lab guide. All right, so the master username is lab user. Master password is time to change with some numbers instead of letters there. Right. So go ahead, paste those in. And really, at this point, we have everything we need to create a document DB cluster, but we're going to go into some of the advanced settings. All right, so you know, at a minimum, there's really not a lot you need to provide to to create a cluster. All right, uh, cluster identifier, instance type, number of instances, and master credentials. But we're going to go ahead and choose some specific uh, settings around network, so that this document DB cluster is in the VPC that we want it to be in. All right, so in your environment, it's already pre-configured with two VPCs. So in this case, you want to pick the VPC that starts with labs dash VPC. The subnet group has been updated for you automatically. All right? Subnet groups are what drive where the compute instances, uh, what availability zones the compute instances are deployed in. Right? If you remember the architecture diagram, we had you know, one, two, three, four compute instances. All right? But in reality, they're deployed across multiple availability zones in the VPC. And what drives this is the, the VPC, VPC subnet group. All right? So this has, again, been pre-configured. Uh, it's just in this case, we've got three different subnets, one in each of the, in each of three different availability zones in this VPC. And those are the subnets and availability zones that will be used for the compute instances. So no need to change it, but to just want to explain a little bit about how that works. Uh, the security group, 
I mentioned you know, security groups are used to um, control access to document DB. So you are going to change this to a, a pre-created uh, security group called docdb inbound, which is going to allow inbound traffic from our Cloud9 IDE. Uh, you can remove the, the default security group. There is actually a security group called default. So you can remove that. And for the rest of these options, we're just going to leave them the same. Uh, by scrolling through, we're going to use the default port, and we're going to stick with the default of encryption at rest at rest being enabled, right? So all of the data is encrypted at rest in the distributed storage volume. All right, we're going with the you know the default of the one day backup retention period. Uh, we're not going to turn on any log exports right now, but you can export audit logs and profiler logs to to CloudWatch right for additional uh, monitoring that you may want to do. We're just going to go stick with the uh, default maintenance window, and we're going to leave deletion protection enabled. All right, so you can't just through a single click uh, unintentionally delete a document DB cluster. All right, so then go ahead and click create cluster. And you will come back to the um, clusters view where we can see that there is already a getting started with document DB cluster that was created as, as part of the setup of the, uh, the hands-on environment here and the demo document DB cluster that, um, that you just created. Okay, so it's gonna take a few minutes and I'll just see uh, Cody, Karthik, any seeing any questions from the participants? Okay, not seen any yet. So, um, yeah, no news can be good news. And hopefully, folks are able to get through the uh, get through the instructions without much much issue. While we wait for that to um, create. Let me just go ahead and walk you through some of the, the capabilities you have in the console in the context of the cluster that already exists here, this getting started with document DB. So again, while you're waiting, um, if we take a look at a, a cluster, the first thing you'll see when you click on a cluster in the um, uh, list of clusters here, just a quick summary what version of document DB, you know, whether the cluster is available or not. In this case, the cluster is available. All three instances are available. There's no pending maintenance. And I've got all of the information that I need to be able to connect to the cluster. All right, so first, you, a, a certificate is required to, to be able to connect. So we have a, a link there that you can just download that certificate and use in your clients. We have the, uh, the Mongo. Uh, shell uh, connect string that uh, you could use, and then also the connection string to use uh, in an application. So do just want to point out a uh, difference between uh, clusters and, and instances. Okay. So if we go back here, um, I'll start here in the list of clusters. I have a, I have the cluster called Getting Started with Document DB, and I have three instances here. Right, I have the one primary, and I have two replicas. If you remember, there's always a single. There's always one primary. And there can be multiple replicas. So I have a, a single primary instance. That's the instance that's going to uh, handle all of the write operations. Can handle read operations as well, but typically replica instances will be used to handle those read in, uh, Sorry, those read operations. Now, now, to connect, if we look at the connect string here, from a client application, just think of it in terms of the, the cluster and using the cluster endpoint to connect to. All right, and that's how we get that replica set emulation that, that Jason mentioned earlier. All right, so if you're familiar with replica sets in Mongo, we, we re emulate replica sets in document DB, and you get that by connecting to the cluster endpoint so that writes are automatically routed to, to the primary uh, instance and 
following best practices of using a read preference of secondary preferred, right? Those reads are going to get routed to to replica instances. So let me see. Let me see how the uh, cluster creation is going here. Okay, so the cluster is created. Um, we can come back to that. You know, if there's further questions about that, certainly happy to come back to that at a later point. But let's go ahead and, and continue on with a, a couple of steps here in the uh, in the lab. So we've we've created the the cluster. Uh, so I walked you through everything that you see here. Uh, and then what we're going to do now is just do some CRUD operations, create, read, update, delete operations on some data that's in the cluster. So you can go ahead and just click next on this uh, sort of intro. And what you're going to do now is go to the Cloud9 IDE and use that to connect with the Mongo shell. So the first thing, go to the Cloud9 IDE, and we'll just do a sanity check, make sure the environment's configured properly. And we're just going to echo a docdb pass environment variable. So OK, the environment is configured properly. So we have uh, the information that we need. So you see in the lab guide that the first thing we're going to do is connect to the that cluster using the Mongo shell. So the way we're going to do that is, is what I just showed. All right, but I'm now going to go to the demo document DB cluster. I click on that cluster identifier right, that has regional cluster. Click on that, take into the connectivity and security tab. And I'm just going to simply copy the Mongo connection string. So I can click on the copy link. That connection string is copied to the clipboard. I can go back into Cloud9 IDE, paste that in. I right, do be aware you want to take off the bracket, insert your password bracket, and we can just use the environment variable here, docdb pass. And when you get the RS0 primary prompt, now you're connected to the document DB cluster with the Mongo shell. So we're going to run a, a few a few commands. Okay, so this again the the guide. Uh, instructing you how to get to that connection string to copy it and paste it in. So now at this point, we're going to do a few basic operations. So a couple of things to, to point out you know, in relation to uh, maybe relational databases, if you're not already familiar with Mongo. All right, Mongo and DocumentDB, we use terms like database. right? That's, uh, that's pretty easily understandable. Collection and, and documents. Right? So a collection in DocumentDB. Uh, you can think of that like a, a table in a relational database, and a document in document DB. It's fair to think of that as a as a row in a relational database. Okay. So just to get to familiar with some basic commands in the shell, we're going to go and execute this command called show dbs, which uh, for the Mongo shell is going to list all of the databases that exist in the cluster. And in this case, there are no databases yet because we just created this, right? So that's to be expected. Um, the, the way to create a database, uh, easy way to create a database is by the use command. So we're going to use catalog and behind the scenes or under the covers, right? A, a, a database called catalog has been created. And now you can see that the context is switched to database catalog. So we're connected to that database. And now we want to see what collections are in there. Remember, collections, you can think of them like tables in a relational database. So again, I don't have any collections because there's no data. So again, this is 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 not uh, unusual, right? This is to be expected. All right, we don't have any data in there yet, so we don't have any collections. Uh, now, we're going to put some data in there. So we're going to do a create operation. And we're going to use the Mongo API, uh, sorry, the Mongo uh, insert API. And we just simply pass in a JSON document. In this case, we've got a couple of attributes, a name attribute, a stock keeping unit or SKU attribute, description attribute, and an inventory attribute. So we can copy that paste it in, and we see that the database has replied with uh, right result and inserted one, meaning one document was inserted. Okay, So that's, that's uh, what we want to see. Uh, we can insert multiple documents through the insert many API. And in this case, you simply provide an array denoted by these square brackets here, an array of JSON objects. 
Uh, so we're in, inserting a Gucci handbag, a round hat, a polo shirt, some swim shorts, and some running shoes. So we can copy that code snippet, paste it into the Mongo shell, and we see that it responded with a little bit different because multiple uh, responds with the object IDs that were generated, automatically generated for these five documents inserted. So we see five documents were inserted. Here's the IDs of those documents that were inserted. Okay, so we've uh, created some documents. Now read. As simplest is to use the find command and you can pass in, in this case, uh, a filter criteria. So we want to find the document where the SKU value equals 1590234. Right, so we're targeting a, a specific document here in our database. So if you execute that, you see that, OK, for that SKU, uh, the document, it's the Ray-Ban Sunglass Pro uh, item in our inventory. Uh, so that's a, a, a simple example of a find. Uh, and we've tacked on pretty there just to make the output a little bit more readable. Right? You don't, you're not required to, to have that on there. It just makes it more readable for the purposes of the slab. All right, so we've created some documents. We've read a document. Now we're going to update the Ray-Ban Sunglass document in our, in our inventory. So using the update API, again, we can pass in the filter. So we're saying, hey, I want to update uh, the document where the SKU is 1590234. And I want to set the reviews attribute to this array. All right, so now all right, you can see we can change the schema just by adding new attributes to the document. All right, there's no uh, nothing, no table chain, uh, sorry, no table schemas to modify or anything like that. We can just simply add new fields to documents. So we've updated that and the result, we see that it matched one document and modified one document. All right, so it found the existing document and it modified it. And we can just do a quick sanity check. We can find that document again and see that, yes, there's my reviews array that has been added. Okay. Um, sorry, I got ahead of myself there. There was the find. And the last thing I do want to call out is um, delete. So we did create, read, and update. Uh, so a delete. We're going to go ahead and delete a document, again, passing in the filter, where SKU is 89706.45. So we can go ahead and execute that command. And we see that it responded with one was removed. All right. The, so you've seen the Mongo shell now and connect using Python. Just go ahead and copy the command here to uh, just pull down a Python script. But first, be sure to exit the Mongo shell. All right, you can type exit. Uh, you could do Control D. There's a number of ways to get out of it. But make sure you're back at the the, the OS prompt here, and go ahead and pull down that Python script and. It's easy to miss, but it pops up over here on the file browser on the left. So if you want to double click that, you can take a look at it. It's pretty simple. Right, we're just uh, establishing, creating a Mongo client based on the environment variables of the username, password, uh, the endpoint. Uh, we're inserting four documents here defined in the seed data. Uh, we're finding a document, we are updating a document, and then retrieving that again to show that it has been updated. So you know, pretty straightforward uh, Python code, but you know, showing you a, a number of those operations. So go ahead and copy the command to execute it. You can close that window there if you want. So execute the command, and you'll see you know, here was the original document, updated it, and here is the updated document, basically updating level from three to level four. All right, and then the last part of this is we're going to scale out. I mentioned uh, adding read replicas. So scale, in this case, we're going to add two instances to the cluster. And the way uh, do that, go back to the, the tab or the browser window where you have the, the document DB console. All right, most likely you're going to be at the details of the demo document DB. So go ahead and you can click on clusters over here on the left and click on the checkbox 
to the left of the demo document DB cluster identifier. And from the actions menu, you want to choose add instances. So it's if you want to provide a specific instance identifier, you can. Uh, you can choose different instance classes, right? If you maybe are add, wanting to add a larger instances for some more complex workloads, like you saw in the uh, uh, the scaling discussion, right? You could certainly pick a different instance class. But in this case, we're going to stick with a consistent T3 medium, and want to add two of those. So the second one is also going to be a T3 medium. Uh, we're not going to do anything with promotion tier in this case, but where that can come into play, you know, in the in case of a node failure, if the primary instance fails, and you want to ensure that um, you know, maybe document DB2 uh, gets preference uh, to become the new primary in case of the existing primary failing, uh, you can define a promotion tier there. But for now, we're just going to leave that as is and click create and that's going to take uh, a few minutes uh, to go ahead and scale out so while that's scaling out uh, we're going to go ahead and resume uh, with the uh, the next portion uh, of the presentation and go into uh, the migration presentation okay so you've just seen how to create a document db cluster right you've uh, interacted with it, you know, stored some data, retrieved some data from it. But in this uh, session now, I want to uh, go a deeper into migrating data to Amazon DocumentDB. And primarily, we're going to focus on migrating from MongoDB to DocumentDB. Uh, so I'm going to start with briefly considering why customers are migrating to Amazon DocumentDB. You're going to learn about available migration tools going to dive deep into the four migration phases, right? discovery, planning, testing, execution, and then examine different ways to use the migration tools along with some best practices. All right, so, but first, why are customers migrating to Document DB? All right, so, you know, here are just four of the reasons, right? There, there are certainly others, but four common reasons you see here. You know, first, Document DB is a purpose built database service for JSON based operational workloads, which certainly makes it a great choice for working with JSON data. All right, second, uh, Document DB allows you to take full advantage of the schema flexibility provided by using those JSON documents. Right? You can index and query data across any of the fields in the document. Uh, document DB is architected for the cloud, right? And as you saw with the separation of compute and storage, right? You can auto scale storage and IOs, right? so you don't have to worry about managing that yourself. And then lastly, again, it is a fully managed service with consumption-based billing model, which is going to help you reduce the overall total cost of ownership. Now, again, there's four things on here. Uh, these are common sources that we see customers migrating from. There are certainly others. All right, but the major driver is uh, customers wanting uh, to move to a fully managed service. Um, you know, when talking about relational databases, right? They want to move to a fully managed service with a cloud native architecture that has seamless scaling and high availability, high durability. Uh, in terms of document databases, many customers are migrating from MongoDB. Uh, we also see customers migrating from Azure, Cosmos DB, and Couchbase. And for key value customers, right, they are migrating from those types of databases because they need more flexible secondary lookup capabilities. Right? They need to look up by things by other than just a primary key. And then search, we see migrations from systems like Elasticsearch. And again, similar to key value, the driver here is when just tech search capability no longer meets the requirements and you need to perform more flexible secondary lookups. Okay, But again, we're going to focus primarily on migrating from document databases and specifically MongoDB. So briefly look at some of the tools available for migrating. So the first one you see here is AWS Database Migration Service, or DMS. Uh, so it supports MongoDB and other relational databases as a source, and DocumentDB as a destination. All right, so you can use DMS to perform full loads of your data and also replicate ongoing changes of your data uh, in near real time. Uh, since DocumentDB is compatible with MongoDB, you can use MongoDB utilities to migrate the data, like MongoDump and MongoRestore. And then lastly, 
Document DB, as you saw earlier, integrates with uh, many of the other AWS services. It also integrates with AWS Glue, so that you can use that to build custom ex extract, transform, and load, or ETL processes to transform data to JSON documents and load it into Document DB. Okay, so first, it's important to understand the different phases uh, of a database migration, right? And we always talk to customers in the context of these four phases. All right, the first is discovery. All right, and this is uh, you know migrating from MongoDB as the is sort of the focus of this. All right, discovery is about capturing the current MongoDB version and deployment configuration information. Right, determining API compatibility, gathering information about the current data set and workload. Uh, the planning phase is. That focuses on how you're going to migrate, you know, which tools are you going to use, and what's the method that you're going to use to satisfy your requirements around downtime, speed, and simplicity. Uh, third phase is testing. All right, and this is the most critical phase. So this is where you're going to test the migration plan that you developed in the planning phase, uh, and then you're going to test that migrated workload for correctness, performance, and load against Document DB. And then lastly, the execution phase is where you're going to perform the real live migration based on the results of the three previous phases. Uh, and the link at the bottom there, that's going to take you to our DMS documentation where you can learn more about these four in greater depth. So just a little bit more on each of these, you know, during the discovery phase, all right, verify compatibility, right? Make sure uh, that the APIs that you're using are compatible with document DB. Uh, you're going to gather details on the current data set and workload characteristics, right? How much data do I have? Uh, how many read operations per second? How many write operations per second? And the reason you need to do this is because it's important that you size your document DB instances uh, appropriately when you first create the cluster. And then lastly, you know, this is where you want to start looking at your migration options, right? The different tools and how they can be used to start coming up with how you're actually going to migrate the data. All right, so during the planning phase, this is where you're going to take the data you gathered in the discovery phase and to determine those document DB cluster requirements, right? How many instances? What is the instance size, right? Then you're going to determine which migration tools are you going to use online, you're going to use offline, are you going to use hybrid method to migrate that data based on your requirements around downtime, speed, and simplicity. And then lastly, uh, you know, at a high level, this is where you're going to determine how to test that migration again and the migrated workload for correctness performance and load and then also what is the client cutover process right how how are you going to actual actually handle cutting over your client applications from the source database to document db Main considerations for testing, a couple of things to keep in mind is uh, use some of the tools that we've developed, uh, index tool uh, to help uh, determine compatibility of indexes to create indexes on the document DB cluster, right? This is going to make the migration uh, quicker if you pre-create these using these tools. Uh, looking at the operations log, all right, so the operations log in MongoDB keeps a record of all of the operations that are occurring, modifying, uh, oh, sorry, all of the operations that are modifying data. So the reason you want to ensure this is sized correctly, because if you have a lot of data and there's a lot of updates occurring, that's more operations to keep track of throughout the migration, right? So you need to make sure that op log is sized correctly so you don't potentially lose any updates. And then lastly, you know, if you are migrating from a sharded MongoDB cluster, uh, you do need to uh, do take some additional steps, like turn off the balancer uh, and clean up any, any orphaned documents that may be out there to eliminate the possibility of any duplicate data in document DB. All right, and then the execution phase, right? If you've done all of the, or since you've done all the heavy lifting in the, the previous phases, the execution is pretty straightforward, right? You're gonna follow the test plan, you're gonna track the progress, and then you're going to inform your customers or partners uh, of the status of the migration and when it's complete. Okay, so the, my uh, migration methods, right? So there's three, uh, offline, Jason talked about these briefly earlier, offline migration, it's lowest compact 
complexity approach. Uh, it's great for getting started quickly and for proof of concepts. Uh, online migration, that's a, a near zero downtime migration. And hybrid migration is a combination of the two. I uh, do be aware it, it is complex, but it leverages both MongoDB utilities and database migration service. Uh, it is important to understand that all of these approaches support uh, Mongo, Mongo Atlas, self-managed MongoDB on-premises and on AWS EC2. All right, so just wanna spend a few minutes on the, the different migration approaches and what they look like. All right, and offline, again, this is the fastest method. But it is the highest downtime uh, because in this case, what happens if you look at the diagram, step one is uh, the customer application stops writing to the source database. And then what you do is leverage the MongoDB utilities. First is to dump the data in indexes with the Mongo dump utility. Uh, step three is optionally, but the best practice, right? Pre-create those indexes on an Amazon Document DB cluster, and then simply use the Mongo Restore utility to restore the data to Amazon Document DB. All right, so it is the uh, it can be the fastest, all right, in the sense that you've just got a couple of steps here, but um, it is also the highest downtime because the the client application cannot be writing to to either database while this is uh, underway, and it is also the simplest approach. Uh, online, uh, you see we've added a couple of a uh, couple of steps here. Uh, in this case, the client application can continue to use the source database. Um, so you see that there, step one. Uh, step two, again, we strongly encourage pre-creating the indexes. And in this case, you use database migration service with um, what we call a full load meaning it's going to migrate everything that currently exists in the source database. And then it's going to, in real time, once all of the initial data set is migrated, keep up with changes through what we call change data capture mode. And then when you determine that all of the data from MongoDB source has been replicated to your document DB destination, you change your application endpoint to the document DB cluster and your cutover is complete. Uh, it is a little bit slower um, than Mongo dump and Mongo restore, but you do have near zero downtime. Uh, it's a little bit more complex. Uh, the third is, is a hybrid. Again, using both options combined. Uh, so this is speed wise, it's in between the two. All right, it's faster than online, but not as fast as offline. Again, near zero downtime, but it is the most uh, complex. And the reason it's faster than online is because you are using Mongo dump to dump the existing data, pre-create those indexes, use Mongo restore to restore all the data to the document DB cluster, and then use database migration service to just replicate any changes that may have occurred while you were doing Mongo dump and Mongo restore. Again, key point here, near, uh, really near zero downtime, really no downtime. All right, the application can continue to write to MongoDB source, and then you still need to turn, you will determine that all of those changes are now present in your Amazon Document DB database, and the, custom, the client application will cut over to Document DB. Okay, and just to round out here, uh, a couple of best practices. You see a couple of links here. These are tools, uh, open source tools that we have developed. Yeah, so they are not officially supported by AWS, but the specialist solution architect team that I'm part of, right? We do develop these and can certainly help you if you have any questions, All right, But one, you know, certainly use the, the tool to verify API compatibility, right? It's, it's really easy to run and I'll give you uh, pretty quickly, give you uh, a report of if you're using any un unsupported APIs or operators or aggregation stages, all right? My a size your cluster based on your needs. Again, this is part of the migration um, phases in general, but uh, we do have tools to help with that, right? So based on the information you gather about data set size, workload characteristics, uh, we have sizing tools that you can use that will provide you the optimal configuration of your document database cluster based on those inputs. Right? And that's gonna allow you to estimate those costs prior to, to the migration, right? So you don't have any surprises after, you're, after you've got everything migrated. Again, create the indexes prior to the migration. It's a lot faster to create those indexes and then load the data than trying to load the data and create the indexes after the fact. Use the tool for that. Uh, talk about the operations log, right? So best practice is ensure your MongoDB operations log or op log uh, can handle uh, 
keeping up with all of the changes that are occurring during the migration so you don't lose any. Something to consider, uh, best practice six, is even though you size your document DB cluster, consider scaling up the primary instance to a larger size uh, depending on the amount of data you have to migrate. All right, that's going to larger size instances are going to handle more concurrent connections, going to allow you to migrate data faster, and then scale that back down after the data has been migrated. And this applies to the, uh, the online and, and hybrid methods. Uh, Certainly take advantage of any tunable parameters to speed up the migration. If you're using database migration service, uh, leverage a capability called segments, which is going to break up and parallelize the load of data. All right, so instead of just trying to sequentially migrate 10 terabytes of data, we'll segment that 10 terabytes into smaller segments and migrate those segments in parallel. If you're using the offline or the hybrid approach, uh, you know, leverage the settings with Mongo Restore uh, to set different options to match the number of vCPUs on the primary instance and then your document DB cluster, right? So you can get the most possible throughput, and get that data migrated as fast as possible. Uh, number eight, lastly, you know, don't migrate indexes and data that you don't need, right? It may sound kind of silly, but you know, do take the time and, and just make sure uh, you know, do some evaluation. If you don't need it, don't migrate it. Lastly, testing is not optional, right? Again, the more time you spend in the three phases prior to the, uh, the final migration, that migration is just going to go a lot smoother. Okay, so with that, you know, thank you for your time. And we'll now transition into the next hands-on lab where you'll see how to actually uh, do one of these migrations. All right, thanks for your attention on the, uh, the migration portion of the content there. So just briefly before we get hands-on with the, uh, the, the second part of the hands-on, which is migration, just have a, a one, really one thing to finish up here in lab one. All right, so as you see, and if you've been following along, right, the scale out uh, should have completed at this time. So I have two, uh, sorry, I have three instances. Uh, and a question did come in uh, about the promotion tier. Is a higher promotion tier, does that mean it has preference or does a lower promotion tier, um, does that have, have preference? So we'll take a look at it here really quick in the context of the UI. So tier zero is highest preference. You know, put it simply tier zero is highest preference, tier 15 is lowest preference. So uh, if you have, uh, and really the reason you want to, to do this is, well, let's just say you do have a cluster where you have different sized instances. Um, maybe your primary is uh, a larger instance than your uh, replicas, right? It would, you, it is possible. So you know you you might have a, a, a replica that's the, the same size as that primary that you could use in the case of failover, but you certainly certainly wouldn't want to fail over to potentially other replicas that are smaller. So you know it's it's a way to con to control which replica the surface chooses to fail over to in the event the primary fails, the higher the tier, uh, the higher the preference. If you have multiple instances that are say tier zero, uh, just think of that as effectively a pool of instances for the service to choose from uh, when failing over. All right, so, so thanks for, for that question. I uh, do have another question here. Uh, says uh, just question about recommendation to pre-creating indexes prior to data load. And does that slow down the data load? So, a great question. So the, the reason we do recommend pre-creating the indexes is, is that is going to perform, uh, be more performant than creating the indexes after the data has been loaded. Uh, so creating them um, after the indexes have been loaded, it's, 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 uh, I apologize uh, if this, if the explanation isn't totally clear, but it's more of a sequential index creation there. All right, so if you create index one and index two, all right, it's going to create index one, then it's going to create index two. If you have the indexes pre-created, those indexes are going to be updated as the data loads. All right, so index one and index two can be uh, getting uh, being updated uh, concurrently as the data loads. All right, so 
Good question. Yeah, a little bit, uh, a little bit more explanation there as to as to why we we recommend that. It's just uh, the fact that as the data loads, indexes are being updated um, in parallel, if you will, as that data loads. Okay. Uh, so back to just one step, uh, really just one step on the previous lab. We scaled out, and the last step here. Uh, is to is to delete the cluster. Oh, sorry, I was wrong. There's two steps. We're just going to devalidate, uh, go back into the um, the Cloud9 IDE, back into the Mongo shell. Right, so if you have the uh, uh, the tab open, you can just use up arrow to get back to that command. And we're just going to use the rs rs status command uh, just for another view to confirm that yes, this uh, there are actually three instances now in the cluster because we see three um, three members in the replica set. Okay, so we can delete this cluster. We don't need it anymore. So select the uh, checkbox by the regional cluster cluster identifier. You can go to the actions menu and click delete. And it's like, whoops, hey, I can't delete it. I remember I talked about the uh, deletion protection, which is enabled by default, right? So you don't inadvertently delete a cluster. So this is saying, hey, deletion protection is enabled. So we're going to go ahead, uh, modify. Right? So just leave it, leave it checked from the actions menu, select modify. Uh, you can scroll down here to deletion protection, uncheck it select continue. Uh, you'll be asked, when do you want to schedule this modification? Uh, this particular modification doesn't require, you know, there's no downtime or anything incurred to change this. So just go ahead, apply immediately, modify, modify the cluster, and now you can come back and, and delete it. And again, just going to ask you one last time, are you sure you really want to delete this? Okay, you do. Do you want to create a, a final snapshot? No, I don't and then go ahead and delete it. Okay, so with that, that takes us to the end of the first lab. Now I know we're too close to time. So the the lab to go along with the, the migration content, uh, these environments that you have access to, they're gonna be available for the, maybe a, another seven hours or so. So you will certainly have time to continue working on the migration lab or any of these other labs that you want to, right? If you've got the time, certainly feel free to work on, on any or all of those. But the, the lab to go along with the migration content, and just to, to give you an idea of what that uh, solution looks like there, right, we've got the, uh, there's a, a MongoDB in, uh, standalone all right, instance running on an, on an EC2. Uh, instance in the VPC. Uh, there's a Lambda that's been deployed that every five minutes is updating some data in MongoDB, so to generate some load. And we have the document DB cluster over here that the data is going to be migrated to. And the database migration service is going to be used to replicate the data from Mongo using what we call uh, a full load plus uh, change data capture or CDC mode. Uh, and the lab is going to walk you through all of that. But you also see the Cloud9 IDE in the mix here. All right, before you actually migrate the data, you're going to use the tools. And you should have the, the links to those different open source tools in the chat. All right, you're going to use the index tool. Uh, to, to basically dump the indexes from the MongoDB uh, cluster, uh, validate them to ensure that they are supported or if they're not supported, right, based on, on uh, what document DB supports, create those indexes in document DB and then perform the migration. Right, so that's you know, what the solution looks like, the different, the different pieces of that solution. But um, you know, in terms of steps, since we won't have enough time to walk through it, uh, you're going to, first of all, just connect to the MongoDB instance through Cloud9, you know, create a couple of indexes, just do some sanity checks on the data there. Uh, and then you're going to uh, dump the indexes, verify compatibility from Cloud9. You're going to connect to the Amazon Document DB cluster to go ahead and create those indexes there. And then the rest of it is using a database migration service to configure um, endpoints 
it's actually the same diagram here. Uh, so there's going to be a source endpoint, which is going to be configured um, based on the MongoDB cluster, a, dest a target endpoint, which is configured based on the Amazon Document DB cluster. Uh, and then you're going to configure a migration task. Right? And what that means in the context of database migration services, uh, you provide a, a source, you provide a target, uh, and then you have basically configure that to tell DMS what data you want to migrate. And in this case, we're, we're simply migrating uh, all of the collections in a database that already exists in MongoDB. So you create the task, that task is automatically started, and after a few minutes, all of the data will be migrated over to your document DB cluster. And then the very last portion is just a, a bit of a sanity check or a verification that, yes, indeed, uh, the data that you expected to be migrated was indeed migrated. So that again, that'll take you through the, the, the second hands-on. Again, you've got these environments for probably about another seven hours. So certainly, uh, you know, feel free to, to look at some of the other labs if you have time, uh, or at the very least, complete the migration lab here. So I thank you uh, for your time. Um, I don't see any other questions. I do thank you for all of the questions uh, that you've asked uh, throughout the session here. Again, thank you for your time and, and, and for your attention. And I think I think we've got um, polls coming up here. If you can just hang on, and we'd love to get your uh, feedback uh, for the polls. <laughs> 